new to presenting to this board. Right? So if you want to take a few minutes to introduce yourself, that would be great. And then give us your update. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Melanie Carr. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development at SPS. So thank you for having me tonight. I, this is my first, I think I take the last executive board meeting. So this is my first general mm -hmm. meeting with this, um, with this body. So thank you so much. I just wanted to give a brief update on the SPS, how we're doing some updates from the last board. Um, the last board meeting that we had. So the system as a whole, I'd say the system as a whole is pretty much on track in terms of our, how we're progressing through connection to employment, our primary element, connection to employment. A significant note I would say is that we're starting to ensure that we're getting greater full-time employment positions. We've moved from, I think, just a quarter last year, we were 75 to about 77 percent of the connection to employment. And we've also increased the wage so of drinks to increase by a this for us is something that we're continuing to look at as the wage floor has changed, you know, as of Monday, as of Monday, April 3rd, the wage floor once again went up. So we've been having conversations with all of our members to talk about how we're making sure that the meeting, the meeting wage floor is being served, that we're getting our meeting wage floor. Um, <laughs> <laughs>
And so looking at community organizations to think about what does it mean to do referrals both in and, in and out of the Workforce One Center. So there's a continuum of service so that no one's being dropped from services that they can be connected to employment. If it's something that SBS, as our centers, do not handle, we want to make sure that we're making a direct connection to employment. What you'll see in the coming months, particularly as we go into the next fiscal year, is looking at what the technological solutions that we can also implement to make sure we're able to track and work with different providers in different ways so that we can actually ensure that people are being connected not only to employment, but the services that they need on their way to employment. So those are the types of things that we're looking at upcoming as we think about the centers that we've launched, the new models that we're testing, um, and of course, I think you all already know about Washington Heights, where we're targeting foreign-born New Yorkers, and that model is also progressing. How do we target specific populations that have barriers to entry, um, to barriers to entry to employment? So on that note, beyond that, I think the other highlights are some of our other trainings, and again, I won't take up too much time because I think we, most of these you are familiar with, but we do have a partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and I think that training has become and that is one of our that is one of our latest initiatives that we're very excited to be working with that office on. This is the Bryce workshop that all of you may have known about, and we'll be selecting a cohort of fellows by the end of this fiscal year. We're also doing post-production training with that office. So we're looking at different opportunities to increase diversity and access in the media and entertainment industry. And that's really the focus of how we're thinking about our trainings and how we're working with that industry. The others, I would say, are Scotch New York. I don't know if any of you same Scotch New York, if you've seen it, and if you don't speak French like me, you may be pronouncing Stage New York, but it's an, it is in fact our initiative to get to get people into the culinary arts. And so we are launching this with West Farms, targeted specifically right now out of school, out of work, to get them into line positions. 18 to 24 year olds, how do we get them both a customized curriculum so that they can be on the job, on the job training while they're working with employers? This initiative was designed with our industry partnership that works specifically on food and hospitality. And what's specifically, I think, important about this one is that the young people do a week of training, classroom-based training, and then they will go on the job training for another 11, 11 weeks. So they'll be learning specific skills that restaurants are looking to, to see for young people, for anyone coming into the wine food industry. Our goal is also to see if they're getting greater exposure to what it means to work in the restaurant industry in New York City, which is a driving business. Um, so we want to make sure that this is an opportunity for young people to truly explore beyond just the market, but how they progress. This is, again, using the theory of career pathways on putting young people on a path to something that goes beyond the initial employment, connection to employment opportunity. So I'm going to stop there because I think there's a lot more that we can talk about, but I definitely want to open it up. But, uh, those, I think, were some of the highlights from what the last quarter actually gave us an opportunity to look at.
And we're talking about when are we counting our trains based on when they begin or when they end? Because we also have this retention question. So I think, well, I, I completely thank you and appreciate the question. I think you also want to know how many people are finishing, how many people we actually train well, in a given year. Right, that would be nice, right? You know, what does it mean for someone to come in and then how many are actually completing that training? Yeah. And I think that continuum is really the question that we want to answer in a larger way. So I, I think when we think about the presentation is moving forward, we can think about well, when does it start, when does it end, and what's the next effect right. regarding retention. And I think, you know, to highlight some of these projects, whether we always want to make sure that we're where we look at the group of time people you have to see to get people in certain number of seats to meet the right requirements and those who are closest and best able to actually complete the training. Right. And so we're able to pilot this. I think as a system we know scale is going to be achieved as we continue to influence providers throughout the city. Yeah. It's not going to be that SBS is going to be able to literally train everyone who needs training, can use training to meet the demand throughout the city. So we want to be able to make sure we have tested and pilot, we pilot and test it and have actual results that we can then share across the market right. to influence the market. So, but to your very specific point, I think that that's part of the presentation that we could in, in, enhance as we move forward. Yeah, that'd be great. Absolutely. And just roughly, what, of that 4,000, what's the, how many are about 2,000 and a half. Yes. Thank you so much. That of course. Was very informative. Um, guys, one last quick question. Is this uh, uh, the universal list of training programs or more that we just used to write them for? I believe this is the universal list. That I, other than this is what was new for the quarter. This is what the updates for the quarter. I'm looking at my assistant commissioner for training. Yeah, sure. this, is, um, this is what's essentially been happening for the fiscal year. So we have just uh, SBS just updated our website and so we have a, a training page which right now has just trainings and recruitment but we're updating it to include sort of our whole world of training so I'll make sure we send around that link. Thank you. So uh, I have a question. Uh, good morning everybody. Um, one of the articulated goals is um, around uh, equity yes. and you know around and so the question really relates to the selection of the employers and what what are some of the criteria you're thinking about so that, that we're actually training people and placing people in, with high road employers that provide decent wages and aren't kind of the minimum wage, low road, dead end job type of scenarios. So we have in place with all of our vendors, there's a median wage that we're expecting them to have a certain percentage of all the placements that they have all connections to employment actually must meet the minimum requirement, must meet the requirement. So if there's a full portfolio that a vendor is actually performing, there's still a percentage that must be above that meeting, that must be above the wage floor. We also said that for all part-time employment, there must be the minimum wage must be enforced for any part-time employment. Other than that, it can be if it's full-time employment, there's a different set of circumstances. We do know that for certain entry-level roles, we are not always going to be is going to be the, the system of choice for all employers. Right? There are certain requirements that they cannot meet, we cannot, and do not work with them. I think it's an integrity to the system in that, and saying that we can't work with every employer because they have an opportunity available, even if it's a large scale, quite frankly, because we're concerned about job quality. So that's something that we're, we are ensuring that we're enforcing with our wage floor, with our full time hour requirements, and the part time hour requirements as well. And we talk about equity, I think that that is where we're also very. We're, we're focused upon targeting who and where we're actually recruiting from to ensure we're, we're providing equity and inclusion in all of our recruiting to make sure that we're getting everyone through the door. Yeah, and that's important, but it's also like the kind of jobs that people are going to end up with yes. and where there's opportunity, you know, where there's uh, decent wages, absolute benefits, and, you know, the opportunity for advancement so it's not just, absolute, um, it, you know, we're really investing in people, you know, in a way that people end up with a piece of life. And I think that that is a, is a philosophical thing, I think, and practically that is the goal, and that's what we're working on and working toward. I think that we, there's this notion of how are we getting people into entry level employment, and then what happens after that. And I think that that is a large <coughs> system question that we're still dealing with, knowing what our requirements are, and also knowing that sometimes the, the connection to employment becomes the most critical thing for people. For some people, that first connection to employment is critical and in a crisis, and we need to be also be able to accommodate that. So the system we're looking across the spectrum of people and their respective needs. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so before we move on to the next section, we should get some 
board business uh, we've done now that we have a quorum. We need to approve the last two sets of minutes from our past two meetings in June and September. Um, and they're in tab one of the book. Is there a motion? <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? Approved. All right, great. And before we go on, I want to thank the young people in the room from Brooklyn Tech High School who are filming our meeting today. Thank you very much. Yay! All right. So our next topic for the day is the summer youth internship campaign that we've launched already. And we're going to hear from Reynolds Graham and Andre White about the program, our goals, and um, we will do a little brainstorming session at the end of this. So, Brent, you want to start with them? Sure. Okay. sure. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Reynolds Graham, Policy Associate with the Workforce Development Board staff. Um, before I begin, just a quick uh, tip for the microphones. I think folks are trying to figure it out. So, uh, if you push down this button here, then it turns green, and that's when it's on. Yes. Um, so during this portion of the agenda, I just wanted to, as Larry mentioned, take some time to talk about the board's summer youth internship campaign, which is an effort to support the city's summer youth employment programs, which include the Last Leaders Program and SYP. Uh, so we'll hear from Andre White and Dalcy Andrade from the Department of Youth Community Development who will provide a brief overview of the programs, important distinctions between the two, and some updates about the summer's program, particularly how the program has changed. Um, I will then give a recap of the board's campaign efforts last summer, and also a preview uh, some of the board's campaign goals for this summer. And then finally, our board chair, Larisse, will, will speak to our company's experience with the campaign, and walk us through an exercise to help us think through how we could consider additional ways to engage our networks and support the programs. So first, I'll hand it over to, to Andre and Sure. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Ron mentioned, my name is Andre White. I'm the Associate Commissioner for Youth Workforce Development Programs at DYCD, and I'm John Dalsey, who's our Director of Employee Engagement at DYCD. Um, as many of you guys know, last fall, the Mayor's Office and the City Council convened a task force to really look at SYP in this current stage, right? There's been a lot of conversations around the model that has not changed for many years, which is not necessarily true. There have been a lot of changes to the program. But collectively together, there were stakeholders from across the city that sat down for three months to really think about what is the purpose of SYP, who should SYP serve, and what are the long-term goals for the program. We came up with some recommendations. Um, uh, a report should be published very shortly, sometime this month, we hope. Um, well, you guys should get a copy of that to see exactly the direction of the program. And based on those recommendations for this summer, we're going to be testing some pilots. And the purpose of the pilots is that this inform the concept paper, which should be coming up sometime this spring, and eventually uh, our <coughs> the fall to a more in contracts for CDOs across the city that will be running the program for us starting contracts in January of 2018. Just to give you some context around the current model, as you know, there are four service options within SYP. There's a service option for young people, young people ages 14 to 15. And primarily, they're focused on community service and service learning projects, as you know, that are less in the network where they're creating, right? So we ensure that they acquire enough skills before we actually place them at the actual employer's site. Um, the second service option is what we call our old youth model. These are young people who are gone the youth model. They're, 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 they're Ready, get a sense of what you want to do, and they're actually placed on the balance bearers provided, I'm sorry, work size in the realm of five bars. The third option is what we call a reform youth option, and these are young people who are virus of employment. They might be just as involved in the foster care system, runaway homeless, or receiving preventative services through ACS. These young people are ages 14 through 24. They were referred through one of the city agencies that we partner with, which includes ACS, DHS, um, DOP, and NYPD. And we ensure that they get the support that they need to make it throughout the six weeks in the summer. And our final option is our Dallas Figures model, which I'm sure many folks are more familiar with, which is our corporate potential program, which is quite competitive for young people ages 16 through 22, and it's employer paid. In terms of our, our budget for this summer for some of the employment program, we expect to serve 65,000 young people at a budget of 160 million dollars. That was that compared to last year. Our budget last year was 93.4 million dollars, and we we're able to serve 60,000 young people. The question is, why is there such a disparity between the budget from this year and last year, the minimum wage increase, right? So um, we 
have to account for that each and every year. And as you guys know, the minimum wage will increase from December 31st this year to $13 an hour, and then the following year to $15 an hour. So those are the things that we're thinking about as we look at the current model and as we scale up for, for the future for SYP. Two of the long term goals in terms of the population is that we're focusing on the one population currently serving 3,000 young people. Um, and the goal is to increase that number to 5,000 by 2020. And also, the last to be this option currently we're serving anywhere from 50 to 1,600 people. And the goal is to get to 5,000 as well, which is very ambitious um, by 2020. Um, the application period for the summer um, is closed. We receive over 145,000 applicants ages 16 to 22 and it's employer pay. In terms of our, our budget for the summer for some youth employment program, we expect to serve 65,000 young people at a budget of 160 million dollars. That was compared to last year. Our budget last year was 93.4 million dollars, and we're able to serve 60,000 young people. The question is, why is there such a disparity between this year and last year, the minimum wage increase, right? So um, we have to account for that each and every year. And as you guys know, the minimum wage will increase on December 31st, this year to $13 an hour, and then the following year to $15 an hour. So those are the things that we're thinking about as we look at the current model and as we scale up for, for the future for SYP. Two of the long term goals in terms of the population is that we're focusing on the one population currently we serve 3,000 young people. Um, and the goal is to increase that number. 5,000 by 2020, and also the last of this option currently we're serving anywhere from 50 to 1,600 people, and the goal is to get to 5,000 as well, which is very ambitious um, by 2020. Um, the application period for the summer um, is closed. We receive over 45,000 applications for 65,000 slots. The lottery process is underway. We run our first lottery on Monday. That the first 20,000 young people. So I'm sure our folks in the room, if you have um, kids that have lots of people that you want to in the program, and they were blessed and lucky enough to be selected, they should receive a phone call or an email from one of our providers to come in for the enrollment process. <coughs> so again, you know, there's a lot going on with SYP. We're really thinking about the current model and the changes that we're thinking about. So it includes how do we make sure that there's a lot of connection between the school year and the summer experience, right? How can we improve the type of jobs that we're offering young people throughout the summer and, uh, and making sure that there's an intentional connection between that pure pathway conversation with young people. Um, there, there's this notion that if you're 14 years old, you have no school that you want to do. And that's, well, that might not necessarily be true, but I think the idea of this why we need to explore at 14. What are the things that you could have, what are the things that you can't do that you might well try and explore each and every year if you're selected for the options. So again, just to, to, to recap, the concept paper for the new model should be coming out sometime in the spring, and the RFP should be coming out sometime in the fall. We wish to definitely share with Chris, and Chris will share with the group. We hope that you guys will definitely look at the model and provide some feedback. Um, we are always looking to get feedback from the field and providers, because especially providers who are going to be on the ground and feel that they're running the program for us. So we'd like to have a little Dulce, who's been doing an amazing job on the ground developing jobs for the Labyrinth Leaders option. Uh, Dulce joined us a year and a half ago, so she's no longer new. She, she's definitely a it part It feels of, like five years. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's definitely a part of the team that has actually contributed so much to the type of job that we've brought on board. Um, and I'm really excited to see what we're going to be doing this year, the type of job that we're going to be developing. So Dulce's all good. Yes, for sure. Um, thank you, Andre. Again, my name is Dulce Andre. I'm the Director of Employer Engagement and Partnerships at CYCD um, for the Youth Workforce Portfolio. And today I just wanted to share a little bit more information about our SYP and also our Ladders for Leaders program. And I think Reynolds will be doing the same thing, but this is really our call to action for everyone around the room. Um, whether you are part of a business or you're a business owner, or I'm sure everyone has a lot of networks, so you guys have access to different businesses. Um, we want to be able to put that call of action out there to you all to be able to provide as many job opportunities for our young people this summer. But before I get started, just a huge thank you to Chris and Reynolds. Um, just thank you for all of your efforts in engaging the board members and bringing more jobs to SYP and the Ladders for Leaders program over the years. So thank you for your efforts. And I 
kind of glance across the room, I see some employers that have worked with us. Um, so also a huge thank you to you all for continuing your participation with us across the years. So thank you for that. So I know Andre touched on a lot of the points, but just going through our SYP program, um, SYP, I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar, but our largest, the nation's largest um, summer youth employment program. It's actually been around since the 1960s, which I'm sure you guys know. Um, but the focus with our summer youth employment program is really revolved around a lot of young people where it might be their um, first introduction to um, summer work opportunities and also being able to provide exposure to different industries and job opportunities. Um, so a lot of the positions coming out of summer youth employment range. So it can be a summer camp or a child care um, center to city agencies and our nonprofit organizations. But one area that we're trying to increase within SYP are jobs within the private sector. Um, so right now about 40% of the jobs are within the private sector and every year we're hoping to increase that number for SYP. Um, as Andre mentioned, for SYP, the target age range is 14 to 24, so very young into your older um, participants. And all of our students through SYP go through a lottery system for selection. And um, based on their selection of a community-based organization, they're working with that organization to be vetted and then refer to different opportunities that they may be interested in. Um, again, it really allows young people to explore different career interests and different industries, which will then um, potentially aid in where they see themselves career-wise, which is great. Um, Andre mentioned a lot of this. Um, this year, we placed 60,000 young people. We worked with over 10,000 different work sites, um, and again, increasing the number of private sector jobs. Um, this coming year, our aim is 60 5,000 young adults, um, also aiming to work with more work sites, so aiming for about 12,000 there. And that's where we really are with SYP. Again, um, it's a long standing program coming out of DYCD, and every single year we're just aiming to see it continue to grow and serve as many young people as possible. And the great thing about SYP is that the only two criteria that students have to meet are the age requirement and being a New York City resident. Um, so the barriers or um, the access to entry is much greater compared to some other programs that might be out here. Um, in regards to ladders for leaders, um, much younger, but an option under SYP, ladders for leaders is about 11 years of age and the scale is much smaller. Um, so last year for ladders for leaders, we were able to place a little over 1,500 students into work opportunities. And Ladders for Leaders does focus on professional internship opportunities that are employer paid, which is different from the SYP model. Um, the students go through a competitive application process, different from the lottery um, selection system, and all the students are coming in with certain criteria that they must meet, um, which includes having a 3.0 GPA or higher, also coming in with prior work experience. So for a lot of our students coming in through Ladders, it's not their first go around with a company or with a business, they've actually been in the field and been working. And um, they're also submitting an essay that really speaks to their career interests and goals and where they see themselves, especially as it connects to their field of study, um, because we are dealing with older high school students and also college students throughout all four years. Um, another great thing about Ladders for Leaders is that all the students do receive about 30 hours of employment training um, before they go ahead and with any company. Um, so that's a great value add that we do have for last year leaders and making sure that the students are prepared and trained um, before they go ahead and interview with the companies that we have um, working with us. Um, just to talk about application, um, and I know Andre talked about SYP applications, Ladders for Leaders continues to grow in demand. So this past year we had a little over 6,000 applications to Ladders for Leaders, and again we placed a little over 1,500 just showing the demand that the students have for these professional work opportunities, but also kind of that call to action again, we were able to place a little over 1,500 given the number of jobs um, that we're getting through our employer partnerships. This year already, our application closed mid-March, and we have over 8,000 applicants this time around. We are aiming for 1,800 to 2,000 in regards to placement, but all to say that the demand coming from students is really large, so we're really looking to all of our partners to be able to bridge 
bring um, new businesses on board to have you all participate as well, whether that's through funding or whether it's through hosting an internet at your companies. Um, and in addition, last year we worked with 475 community businesses, and this year we are hoping to see that increase. And um, a huge thank you, I know Linnea is here, but we've been working very closely as well with the Center for Youth Employment and the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City who have been doing an amazing job in really targeting the different industry sectors, ranging from fashion, media and entertainment, to real estate technology, and um, bringing in some more employer partners to the program. So a huge thank you there. Um, so with your help as well, we're hoping that um, the number of jobs continue to grow. Um, well, I'll to say, I'll, I'll stop there, but just um, again, a thank you to everyone. And just um, another call there because I just want everyone to think about their first job or your first internship and just thinking about how did you get there, who were some of your support systems and um, being able to help you gain access to that opportunity. Um, in a way, we're doing that for young people in New York City, um, whether it's your first time job or whether you're a college student that's looking to get a relevant internship experience within your field of study. We're really here to provide access to opportunities and really make sure that students um, are able to work and translate that experience onto their resumes and then onto other amazing work opportunities and ultimately into professional opportunities because we get a lot of our alumni coming back who are project managers, doctors, it's a range of different things and they usually point to SYP or lunch careers as their first job. So um, again, looking forward to seeing what um, opportunities we can get from folks around the table. I think much are great. Uh, we participate in the last few years, um, what is the uh, requirement in terms of days that they would be working in the unpaid versus the ladders program? Yeah, really good question. Um, for example, when there is a city subsidy, there's parameters given that the city is paying that salary. So in regards to time frame, the interns would typically start right after the July 4th holiday. So they would start July 5th, and they can only work six weeks for 25 hours a week. So it's pretty limited, and again, that's taking into account the thousands of students that we're serving and being able to pay all of those students. Okay, so as for the class, would you mind speaking? Oh, sorry. sorry. And just to add on, as for unsubsidized, there's much more flexibility, especially with the large <coughs> right. So if an employer is paying the student salary, um, the student can work full time hours, and they can work longer than the six weeks. So. Typically, two ladders, our college students are starting right after their academic year wraps up. So they're usually starting end of May into early June, and they're working full-time hours up until they're going back to school. So there's a lot of flexibility when an employer is able to pay directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'd like to speak to you because I really have unlimited opportunities and they are paid. I would be willing to, you know, we have security industry, it's a great career. Um, my boss, who's head of the company, started as an officer, so we have a lot of promotional opportunities, but we, I have 26,000 employees, so we're always looking for people. I would be willing to uniform them and to just keep them for six weeks to give them uh, an entree to a career, but I have to have them be able to work a full-time week, or at least minimally 24 hours a week, so if we could exchange parts later on, I could probably take quite a few. Yeah, for sure. That, okay. sounds, that sounds great. And there's options that we can talk about. Here. Okay. So, and just to um, let everyone know, I'm going to sit around our um, lunch for leaders and floor brochure. My contact information is back. Um, so if after this meeting or after you go <coughs> get back to your offices, I'm going to be happy to answer any questions that you have. Sure. Uh, 140,000 applications that you mentioned. Yes. Um, I understand there's not that many qualifications, but how many of them are not all of them? Typically, what percentage of the, of the, the lot of applications? Right, so, so, so it's a good business, right? We've seen those few years, although we were seeing some contacts last year, we were seeing more than 40,000 applications for 60,000 jobs. So those few of those 60,000 jobs, we made over 100,000 offers, right? So not necessarily because the person applies to plus, that's why we Sometimes in June, they might find that they have to attend some school and not be able to work. Or they found that that's other alternative plans for them. So, again, to get to that certain point where that uh, mentioned earlier, they are different situations that we can task and get into the progress. Well, of the 140,000 that you've received, or let's say in the past, whatever you're experiencing, mm -hmm. how many of them do you live in? Let's say you don't live in New York City, or your, your age is the right age. Well, the way the system is built, right? If it's out of the way, that's the system. So also that's what we're applying to ensure that you're not eligible because you're under age or over. So they're all qualified and also the nature of the trust and ensure that your your, your address is on this on the city of trust. So you're able to apply. And and currently right now do you have a gap in finding 
we're always looking for a size, right? So challenge, especially for the younger youth, um, and the ages 14, so I'm sure if you're in places of experience that you're being sitting and not necessarily talking to the young person on the TV. So we have to be very careful how we frame the conversation around taking on young terms, and that's something that Delcy and the team has been working on. Um, and providers have done a great job in the response to the four child development, as Delcy mentioned, working with the nurse fund and CYP, they seem to grow with our private sector jobs. But across the board, it's always a struggle. Yeah, that's my question. So, so you're saying that you're always struggling to find those beliefs? Right, because we're scaling up tremendously each year. We awarded these contracts a few years ago. We awarded contracts for 23,000 slots, right? And some providers are obligated for. We have asked them to triple the number of young people they're serving, which means they're going to triple the number of work um, opportunities that they're, that they're giving to young people. So, um, you know, it's a strengthening system with a handful of work and work with our partners across the city. We're able to get to that number each year. As we potentially scale up beyond 65,000, it's going to get more challenging. Thank you. What is the deadline for our work site and where we to sign up? It's May 13th, but we're, we're pretty flexible um, beyond that. If everyone would just mind speaking into the microphones when they uh, ask a question. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, I think you went a little too fast when you talked about the difference in the increase as a result of the new minimum wage. What was that number again? The budget number, the budget. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so for this year, we're going to serve 65,000 young people. Our budget is $160 million. 160? Yeah. That's close to last year's 93.4 million. Is this a state covering you? Yeah, so SYP is one of those programs where there are so many different funding streams. For example, the mayor's we invested largely into this program. Um, we saw the CTEL portion is now based on $72 million, right? Which has never been done before. Uh, the statewide, the state governor um, allocated $35 million statewide for SYP, and New York City typically receives 51% of that allocation, so anywhere from maybe $16 to $17 million. As you know, the state budget is, you know, there's state compensations around approving the budget. Uh, so once that, that's approved, then we have a better idea of where we're going to land. But historically, I've seen the past 10 years, we've always gotten at least 51% of the state allocation. Okay. And lastly, since you're looking to increase opportunity in the private sector, have you considered any kind of um, tax breaks or other than the subsidies um, in order to encourage industries in the private sector to you know, be more open to creating some of the slots? Right. Um, we have not looked at that locally here in New York City, but on the state level, you know, the governor has a program that's geared towards um, businesses that involve more than young people. There's a tax break option, but as you know, fortunately, it's many private businesses typically just don't want to deal with the paperwork that comes along with um, typically uh, different contracts. Um, and we have seen a lot of folks push back on that. They prefer to just take an HR and pay for it, or have a subsidized slot of those going through the hassle of confusing all the required paperwork just to get a tax break. But I mean, it's something that we, we have thought about uh, here in New York City, but we have not really. We implemented it for four months of business, um, which I can't even get into because I don't think I have to do about those things. Isn't that a saving in the stock market program? No, yes. So, yeah. so in an interest in, and we have time, but I think it's probably a good idea to move on and hear what our goals were and how we did last year. So, if you want to go ahead. Sure, sure. Um, so thank you, Andre, and I'll thank you, Andre. Thank you. Um, so I'll speak very briefly about the board's uh, summary of internship campaign. Just as a reminder, members can participate in one of three ways, or multiple ways, um, hiring a young person directly, uh, making a financial contribution to support internship slots, or connecting someone in your network to, to either Labs for Leaders or SYAP. Uh, last year, the board set a goal to secure 250 internship slots, and we surpassed that goal. We, uh, as a board, secured 265. Um, and that's, by the way, three times more than the board's committed in 2015. So that's a really big jump from, from previous years. Um, we also had 20 out of 20, uh, possible 20 members take part in, in the campaign, which is about 70% of the board, which is amazing. Uh, for this summer, we really wanted to push to push both those goals. And so uh, we have increased the goal overall to 300 internship slots. Um, and we also set an individual goal to secure uh, eight slots per member. Um, I should also add that we had set up a goal, an interim goal, for the board to secure 200 internship slots by the end of March. Um, so today, April 7th, we are a little short of that goal, but we're making very good progress. We're, uh, we've secured 123 internship slots with the support of seven members thus far.
far. Um, and I know that some folks are still considering uh, how they can commit to the program, and I know that we might have just had another one today, which is amazing. Um, so I want to acknowledge that, but overall, we are behind pace. So I do want to, you know, I do want to continue that that call to action and hope folks can, can find a way to contribute. Um, so we do look forward to surpassing our goals this year as well. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Larisse, um, who will speak to her company's experience with the campaign and help us consider some additional ways to engage our networks. Thank you. So I wanted to just share my company's experience with um, Ladders for Leaders. This will be our third summer of participating in the program. The first year, we hired two interns and donated money through the mayor's fund. I think that year we donated 55000 Last year, we hired one intern for the summer and donated 60000 And this year, so far, we're hiring three interns and also donating. Um, the experience for the company has been um, incredible. The interns from Letters for Leaders were so impressive. After the first summer, one was hired on to work part-time during the school year. Last summer, our intern was hi also hired on part-time to work during the school year. The reviews for these young people were amazing. There wasn't anything to be bad. They worked really hard, they were really dedicated, very, very appreciative to have these jobs. Um, so the, the whole program, Ladders for Leaders in general, has been just a wonderful experience for the company. I do want to talk, though, a bit about how we were able to make it happen, because it's not easy. Um, and it requires work for all of us to get these people into our companies or into um, the companies of people in our networks. For me, it required constant outreach to the HR group, um, constant discussions with why we should hire these people. It's, I work for a utility. They don't have a lot of extra money. Um, and they do have the jobs that we do have available. Often, if you're not in a professional setting, can be dangerous, so that limits um, the number of people we can hire and the qualifications we need to be hired. So we worked really hard to get the interns in, and then um, to the extent we couldn't meet the goal through direct hiring, we had to go to our community development group and have numerous meetings. I had had numerous meetings with them to explain why this program is so wonderful for our city, for these young kids, but more specifically why it's a benefit to our company. And there always has to be that tie if you're at a you know, private corporation, why does it benefit? So um, I don't want to leave you with a false impression it's easy, but I do want you to know that it's well worth all of the hard work, and it's a commitment we should all really try to make for um, these young people in our city. So I do want to let you know that, at least for me, Daphne was incredible in explaining the program to um, all the different groups in the company that needed to understand it. They worked closely with HR, they worked closely with community development, and they really worked hard. So I wasn't doing this alone. Can I, can I put the boss on the spot for a second? How did you explain that it would be beneficial to the company? Um, it was a lot of different ways, but so we, we are committed to donating a certain amount of money within the city and our other service areas, but within the city. And it really became an issue of limited resources and which entities would get the money. Um, 60000 is a lot. It requires approval of my company all the way up to the highest level, so the CEO has to sign off on it. And um, it, it was basically kind of, I don't want to say who the other competitors were for the money, but saying why it would be better than other competitors for that limited pool of money. Um, so, that was essentially it. I mean, it increases our reputation in the community, it benefits our customers, these kids are also our customers, um, and so, and they also want a pipeline of qualified people coming in, so the hope is that these kids who are either sponsored by the company, they understand that we sponsored them, or the ones that were directly hired have such a positive experience that they want to come back. Um, so it was twofold. I just want to put a wider point on um, Delcy and her team's responsiveness and their help to our team. 
in doing this. So I think that um, we are a nonprofit. We place interns in the businesses on the yard itself. Um, we have a very specific goal around hiring hyper locally. And um, so I, I think you said it, but I just really wanted to say that you know, like they are a really um, responsive um, team and they do a lot of the legwork in order to make this happen. So, you know, if you're thinking about doing this, know that you have a team that will work with you in order to make sure that this happens for the young people. So we've had a great um, relationship with them for the past two years and then we're excited to get started again. And I do want to say that the cost of hiring one of these young people is relatively low for the benefit you're getting. It's less than 2,000 per student in one summer. In the big scheme of things, that's really not that much money, and they're doing really good work for your company. So it's a huge benefit. It's a bargain. <laughs> okay, so what I wanted to do next is have everyone kind of, you know, uh, Reynolds discuss the three ways we can meet our goals, which is hire directly, donate money, or tap our networks. And I thought it would be a good idea if we just kind of broke off into groups of two and brainstormed for just a couple minutes about So um, it looks as if everybody has taken full advantage of the few minutes we had to brainstorm. Does anyone want to take some time to share with us ideas that you came up with? Yeah, I'll, yes, I'll take to I'm sorry for being late. Uh, I'm not sure no, if this works for you. Press the button. Pardon? Oh, it's better now. So yeah, my name is Usama Mada. I've been on this board for some time now. And one of the ideas that uh, we've been kicking around, and I spoke to Chris and I spoke to Greg Fisher, and, and that we are a construction manager in the company, architecture company. And we feel that uh, you know we can take many of the high school graduates who don't necessarily have a goal of, of going to college at this point, and train them anywhere from three months to six months and, and uh, for a training called special inspection. And, and I believe they can make a, a good money comparatively uh, to other in, in industry. It's not a unionized job, it's a special inspection. Any building construction that happens within the five hours requires a special inspector to verify the installation of the steel, then verify the installation of concrete, verify the, uh, anything within the, within the construction uh, of the building. And, and our company is heavily involved in addition to other services providing the service. And we have been participating um, in youth development and youth, youth, youth uh, program and also in the uh, ladders for the leaders program over the years. Obviously, we like to personally, me being the, the CEO, I would like to increase that you know, the number of the students. But there's a continuous fight between me and my brother who's the CEO. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hope you can understand that. And, and, and uh, so, so I feel that we can make a big a difference by initi taking initiative in the special inspection and, and I really appreciate the help, how we can get together and get that program going. And, and these people not only will be trained, uh, uh, can be paid from day one, you know, uh, a good uh, amount of money, I think I would say, uh, maybe I would say uh, $20 start point just the training starts. Once they're trained they can make about at least $30 an hour. Uh, for a high school graduate it's a big opportunity I think we've been missing. Um, so so I really I, I you know like to get something done on that front. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Sure. Uh, so just a suggestion uh, um, I'm thinking about so so I'm an air conditioning contractor. Okay, sure. So I would, from your position, you have a lot of influence over the various trades that work on the jobs that you manage. I wish we had, but we are the eyes and ears of the um, government, you know, to making sure everything's done right. So some of that could be making recommendations to those who you work with regularly, so sure. they should hire um, someone for the summer. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm right. on the board of New York Building Congress. I need mean, to say it yes. once. I'm on the board of Society of Military Engineers, uh, another one. Uh, CIV Congress board, and there's, there's so many others. So, so you're right. You're absolutely right. Well. But we need uh, a, 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 yes, I think we need, uh, I think uh, now we have a new president at Building Congress, uh, Scarlo uh, Cicero. It's a well known name, and, and, and he's a good uh, friend of, of the mayor. And I would say that, yes, now there is a possibility that there is a change of leadership at the Building Congress. And I think, yes, we can connect with the Building Congress and some of the members of the Building Congress are really, really, very
very successful at large firm. And, and, and so you're right, I, I agree with him. And, and I guess I'll speak for, for these guys, but sure. um, they've been great at coming down, so I've done it a few times okay. with these industry groups, sure. where they'll come down and speak to the group, and speak to the membership. Wonderful, a great idea. So, so well, that I can arrange. Go, <laughs> I, I can definitely <laughs> arrange. Yeah, I would love to arrange that. If, if, you know, if, if you need any help, let me know. Um, I'm a board member, I can arrange that, any, that meeting, a, a small presentation to the, the key members of the building conference. Uh, we'll go to their office in you know, uh, 28th Street, 40, 44th, 28th Street. And it's very open-minded, very receptive. And there's a guy from Brooklyn, I think he's, he's heavily, you know, interested, I think. Can, can, can I um, ask for maybe make a decision? So last year I sent out 200. They weren't brochures, they were brochures. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but could, to make it easier for us and for others, just send you our Rolodexes and with a letter, you know, that you could then, you know, mail the brochures out to.
morning, everybody. Um, I would say this is the, the fun part of the program, but it, it really isn't. Uh, so, you know, um, just before we sort of talk about this, I mean, uh, we do face some pretty significant budget cuts this year. The truth is nobody really knows what they're going to be yet, but we have a pretty good feeling that something's going to happen, and that it's going to be pretty significant. Um, and, you know, we're going to walk you through a few scenarios today of what that could look like in terms of the total amount of funding that we could see it to lose. Um, at City Hall's request, we're not going to ask um, small business services and the Department of Youth and Community Development to speculate about how they might have to, you know, trim programs or cut back on certain things because, number one, it's still just speculation. We don't know what the cuts will look like. And number two, uh, the city is committed to fighting the cuts. Um, the city really wants to try to, you know, not see all those dollars get lost from domestic federal programs and move military. And so uh, there's a real sense of wanting to, to fight against those cuts and working with Congress to do that. So we're not going to really get into any details about how programs can be affected. You can use your imaginations. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that out there to, to start. Uh, and then we are going to hear from Melinda Mack, who is no stranger to this board and probably knows many of you. Um, she used to be the acting executive director of the board, so we're really happy to have her from NIATEP, the New York Association of Training and Employment Professionals, and she'll be talking about what's going on with the pulses in DC uh, and some of the ways that um, we can take some actions to respond to these so just as a, as a reminder, in, in December, we had a uh, closed session meeting. We talked about the roles of the board. Um, but just to, to briefly remind you that um, you know, the board really does set the budget to the local area. Our budget is $65 million, so this is squarely um, within the, the roles and the powers of the workforce board. I mean, thinking about the budget and the potential impact. So as a little bit of context, I'm going to talk a little bit about the just the mechanics of how the, the funding works and, and what the potential impacts could be. Um, so there's sort of a saying, the president proposes, but Congress disposes. Um, the president proposes uh, a budget, and as I think most people are aware, the skinny budget came out on March 16th. Um, and for domestic programs, you might call it an emaciated budget because there were you know about $54 billion worth of cuts proposed. Um, but it is ultimately up to Congress to decide. They, they have the power of the purse, and so they're the ones who ultimately decide um, how much each, uh, each program might get cut. Um, so they'll, they will take that proposal into account. So this is my, my favorite slide. We're about six months away from fall, but um, hopefully this looks appetizing. Uh, but, so there, there, are really, there are sort of two critical uh, variables that will determine what level of WIO funding we get. Um, first is Congress's appropriation, so how big is the pie? How big is the pie of money that we are working with um, in terms of funding that's available nationally? And then the slice of the pie, the, the size of the pie, the slice that we get is determined based on a formula that really is not subject to politics. It's, it's simply based on data. So the question is, how big is the pie going to be? Don't know that yet. And then we do know how big our slice is going to be, which, which I'm going to talk about. Is everybody like pumpkin pie? I'm going hungry now, actually. Um, so, so there's a federal formula, first of all. So WIOA is a block grant program, and there's a, a formula based on, it's a little complicated, but it's things like the number of people who are unemployed in your area, how concentrated in certain areas of uh, whether a lot of people are unemployed, et cetera. So it really is not a political thing. Um, but you can see, for this is New York State, um, you know, we are, we're going down in all three of our funding categories, which are adult and dislocated worker and youth. And you know, uh, it, it's less than a percentage point, but when you're talking about a pool of money that's uh, roughly $3 billion, that, that's a lot. Um, that's a lot for New York State to be going down. Um, and again, this has nothing to do with cuts. This is just our, you know, our slice of the pie is decreasing by that much. So we're, we're already in a position where, essentially, we're the victims of our own success as a state, because we are doing better relative to other states. And so our, our, the, the size of our slice is going, to be, uh, is going to be less than it was this past year. Um, and that's compounded by the fact 
that um, there's a, form, uh, a funding formula within New York State itself for the 33 local areas. Um, and the formula works in a very similar fashion. And again, we are the victims of our own success locally. We're, uh, you know, our economy is doing well, and we have fewer unemployed people relative to other parts of the state. And so, you know, these are our shares of the funding in adult. We always have more than half of the state's money, but we're, we're seeing a decrease um, across these areas. So that's just to say that, again, we're, we're the victims of our own success in the sense that the, the size of our pie is going to be smaller this year, the size of our slice relative to whatever size the, the total pie is nationally. So what does this mean? Brass tax. Um, so even if current funding levels were exactly the same federally this year as compared, or next year as compared to this year, uh, we would still see a loss of 7.7 million, which is about 12% for a local area. And that's assuming that the, there's no cuts, which is highly unlikely. Uh, and that would be almost 5 million off of our adult funding that SPS gets, and almost $3 million off of the youth funding that DYC gets. So that's just our, almost our baseline. Keep it the same. We're going to lose 7.7 .7 million. Our, our current but new budget dollar is worth 65 million this year. Uh, and what's a little scary is I think you, you probably recall last year we talked about the fact that the you know, New York State Department of Labor could take up to 15% right off the top for uh, governor discretionary funds. And you know, we, we tried to push back on that a little bit because we saw a decrease um, this year over last year. But to put that in perspective, that was about. Uh, Three and a half, four million dollars off of seven million. So this is this is bad. Um, so what if WIOA was cut by ten percent? Let's just put that out there. What if it was cut by ten percent? Well, first we have the problem where the size of our slice is shrinking, and then the cut has an additional impact. So altogether, that could mean a thirteen point four million dollar reduction in our WIOA funds, which would be about twenty one percent. So that gives you a sense. And then what we know from the president's skinny budget, right, the U.S. Department of Labor was overall proposed to get a 21% budget cut. Uh, and that's just the department as a whole. That's not with respect to any individual programs, which could be more or less than that. Um, but if that were to go forward, uh, that would mean basically a $20 million cut. 30% uh, reduction from where we're at this year. Again, part of that is fact that our slice of the pie is getting smaller, but the cut really hurts when you combine all that together. Um, so this, this just gives you a sense of the mechanics and the math, right? And if it's more than 21%, it's going to be more than, than $20 million. Um, so this is this is pretty major. Uh, and I don't know if we've ever, um, in the history of the board, faced a, a potential cut this, this potentially severe. Um, so that's just a little background so you understand what the, what the cuts might look like. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Melinda, um, who's going to give us some of the uh, what's going on in Washington, D.C., and tell us a little bit about what we can potentially do as a board. I have a quick question. So when you say fiscal year 18, not calendar year, this is starting this summer, right? It would be July, essentially July 1st. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but essentially for, for the, the next Cuts of those don't get implemented right away by the feds, right? So the, the federal budget starts in October. Right. In previous, the slides can explain. Yeah. No, oh, 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 o
and also share how we've been sort of pushing back against um, the state budget to think about ways to increase resources, recognizing that the federal system is going to continue to be a pretty uneven, uh, sort of unresourced space for workforce development that we might need to think about the state as another place for investment. All right, so what's the status of the OEO funding? So Chris talked about the skinny budget, uh, or the emaciated budget. Um, the use Department of Labor has outlined a 21% decrease uh, as part of that. It's a little bit frightening for us to think we could be having to negotiate back from 38 to 40% cut to try to get, on a good day, the 20, 15 to 20% cut, right? I think that's something that we're nervous about and struggling with. Um, I will say that we are not necessarily the best position to push back based on our congressional delegation. We tend to be a bunch of Democrats, right? Um, we do, however, have a number of folks in Congress in upstate New York who are very red, not little red, very red, right? Uh, Chris Collins from Western New York uh, was one of the first folks out of the gate supporting the Trump administration. Uh, he's actually the congressional liaison to the administration. Uh, we've been working really hard to keep him engaged and going out to the system so he recognizes the importance behind it. Um, we do also recognize that there's a need for a national approach. And so from the state association perspective, we're working with the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, that's an important one, you know, Illinois, Ohio, Florida, and sort of doing a coordinated approach, approacher effort as we approach many of these congressional reps as well as uh, folks like the National Governors Association. We know that it may not be worthwhile Chuck Schumer's reaching out, and maybe better if someone who is close with Paul Ryan's office is reaching out. And so we try to be very strategic in our outreach. I will say there is a slight glimmer of hope so this is the point where we all cheer and smile and say, yes, we're not running for the hills just yet. Um, you know it was bipartisan, right? In years past, bless you, um, in years past when we stood up here, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, we were waiting for WIA to be reauthorized year over year over year. If you look at the skinny budget, anything that was not reauthorized was wiped out, basically. So the good news is we actually have an authorizing bill. So we are a law. We have a budget line. Um, so we, we are, we're not fighting that fight this year. We also recognize that because we owe it was bipartisan, it's pretty easy to talk about skills development. It's pretty easy to talk about jobs as part of every politician's platform. It's sort of the way we talk about it, and talk about how we're serving and meeting the business customer needs, as we heard around the table, but also serving job seekers and creating taxpayers. And so I think, again, the approach that we have, the approach we've been taking, has been engaging for both the R's and the D's. We also have um, two reps on the Ed and Workforce Committee. So Elise Stefanik, who is in the North Country, she's the youngest congresswoman ever elected to Congress, fun fact. Um, she, she's on Evan Workforce and is very close with Speaker Ryan's office. And then our new congressional representative here from Harlem in the Bronx, um, who, if you haven't been engaging yet, should be on your, your short list. He just got appointed to House Evan Workforce. And those are the folks who really make the decisions at, that, at the congressional level around how to invest or make recommendations to appropriators for investment. Um, just, yeah, please go just, ahead. just one comment. We heard earlier about outreach efforts in Washington Heights. If there's not already a connect to uh, SBI, it might be, you know, helpful to engage him in uh, um, in that effort so that there are real life examples that he can point to. That's a great idea. Okay. You know, his constituents would be touched by that effort. So one of the things that we did, and again, some of you have, were participatory in this effort. Um, we did get. Uh, to 200 letters that went in from businesses across the state to congressional reps, including our appropriator, Nita Lowy, talking about the impact of workforce development on their bottom line, <coughs> more or less saying, hey, listen, like, we don't have to do this, but we're doing this because it's good for us and it's good for our community, and it creates the pipeline of workers that we need. And in this area, era where we have a relatively low unemployment rate, we need to do everything we can to make sure that the folks who live in the communities can benefit from the economic development of the communities. And so this, when we were down in D.C., Folks have the stacks of letters. Uh, it wasn't just New York, California, the other 17 associations we work with all sent them out. So it was close to 7,000 letters that went out uh, nationwide. Um, so to see those stacks of letters felt pretty good to recognize that the staff, not just the congressional reps, but the staff who make the decisions and do the informing of the decision making understood the impact. All right, so in terms of the timeline, to answer your question, uh, sir, um, DC insiders are betting that we're going to have a continuing resolution. So right now, the federal government is only funded till April 28th. So we need an actual uh, congressional act, tra traditionally a continuing resolution, which is basically saying we will agree to just extend the budget 
and keep it flat funded for a certain period of time until we can make another decision, right? And so right now we're hoping or expecting a continuing resolution through the end of September, which would take us to that October 1 budget year. What we're hearing is there's a likelihood or a possibility that there could be another continuing resolution for FY18. That's good news for us because it means flat funding. It sort of insulates us from the cuts. It gives us some more additional, some more additional time to do some advocacy uh, down in DC and continue to prove success. So in many ways, we're actually hoping for, hoping for a CR. There is also potential, depending on what the president decides to do with tax reform, and again, I apologize for getting in the weeds because everything is so interrelated, that they could be doing an omnibus bill. And an omnibus bill is sort of like where you just tack everything onto the back end, right? Say, okay, like how many things can we scoot through here? Because we know Congress is gonna approve this package and that could actually impact whether or not we get a lot of resources or no resources at all, right? So we could actually see something sort of skate through towards the fall um, that would, would have an impact on funding for, for uh, the wheel of uh, funding streams. What we're also hearing is that there is a budget bill that ends up passing. Labor HHS, or Labor the Health and Human Services space, that funding bill in particular is always the most contested. And it's because it has really big ticket items like education, right? Community colleges, Pell Grants, uh, funding for Head Start. So even if all the rest of the funding bills go through, there is a very good possibility that just the labor side might end up on continuing resolution. So again, Chris gave you a lot of bad news. I started with bad news. This is, again, our glimmer of hope that there's a pretty high likelihood we can be on continuing resolution for the next year. Um, we do have, again, some, some good, good news, good fighters on our, on our side, right? Chuck Schumer, who is pretty tireless and a, a very good negotiator. Um, he is the, the minority, minority leader, right? He can sort of do a lot on our behalf. I think one thing we have to recognize is he's negotiating at the most other most levels to try to figure out how much goes to defense and how much goes to non-defense, right? So whether or not he takes very specific line items and uses those for his, for his negotiating tactics, we don't know just yet. However, Anita Lowy, who is a ranking Democrat on appropriations, has been a huge supporter of workforce development. Um, there was just a hearing uh, Tuesday in her opening remarks, she talked very specifically about the impacts of workforce development in Westchester, where she's from. Um, we were thrilled to see that she was on record supporting workforce development. Um, and then again, finally, um, we know that Joe, Joe Crawley, who was sort of in the, sh the shadows of Charlie Rangel for many years, um, he's on Ways and Needs. And so again, he's another person in your district, in your area. Um, he has a lot of influence, again, on how those dollars are, are spent and allocated. So I encourage you to reach out to, to, to Congressman Crawley. So as I mentioned, there was a recent hearing on WIOA. Um, I will say, for folks who've been in the field for a while, none of this will surprise you. It's the same kind of feedback we keep getting about the system. Um, the good news is that the congresswoman who supported or presented, uh, Congresswoman Del Rosa from Connecticut, uh, she used uh, data that was presented and provided by the state associations through the US Conference of Mayors. So we found based on the, the calculations we've done on cost benefit, it's about a dollar seventy-two return on investment for every dollar you spend on WIOA. So it is a good use of, of federal funding. We did hear consistent feedback that there's concern about the effectiveness of job training, whether or not you're actually getting a return on investment for job training. Part of the challenge, just to sort of ease folks' minds, is when you measure it at too short of a time period, right? Odds are you're not going to see an increase in someone's wages if they just got out of training, right? Or if they're still in training. And so depending on the length of the training, depending on what the occupation is. We don't actually expect to see huge jumps, but if you just sort of look at the, the baseline data, you can make some uh, wrong interpretations. That being said, I do think it's important that we all recognize, and SBS and DYCD and New York City in particular is good about this, you need to be keeping track of what's happen, happening. You need to be understanding the dynamics within the system. You need to understand the employer impact and effect. Um, and this not, doesn't need to just happen here, but across the state and across the country, because we need to be able to talk about why these dollars are useful and being well spent. Um, in terms of the tenor in DC, again, I was just there last week. Um, it, it's a weird time. I mean, I really can't underscore <laughs> the 60 years they've been doing this. It is a weird time. And it's very strange and odd to go into a congressional member's <coughs> office and almost have them like spill the beans. Like they're so thrilled that someone's there that they can talk about all their problems. <laughs> be um, and everyone is, um, no one's complimentary of anyone at this point, right? I think everyone's sort of disenfranchised with what's been happening. It's interesting because there is eagerness to get back to work. 
And folks talk very fondly about the bipartisan nature of WIOA. It's always like, like remember those WIOA days when we were negotiating in this bipartisan way? Those were the good old days, right? So we expect to see some of the more workforce-oriented legislation probably move a bit more quickly than some of the non-workforce-oriented legislation. We expect to see uh, CTE Perkins done relatively soon. Um, there was a bill that got pretty close to the finish line last Congress. We expect that to be taken back up relatively soon. Um, we also expect to see the Higher Education Act, in particular, the emphasis of the president and his administration around Pell Grants and community college financing, et cetera, will likely be taken up relatively quickly as well. The, the next big one is TANF, um, which we've been paying very close attention to because there's a huge impact not only on the workforce system, but just across the, across the board in terms of the services we provide to New Yorkers. Um, what the main rhetoric is so far is that any of these pieces of legislation need to align with VIOA. So the idea is the benchmarks, the performance, the, the sentiments around career pathways, that there's a push and ideal to align to those, this new federal workforce legislation. And the idea here is if we're creating a system, the pieces should be able to fit together. We should be creating artificial policy barriers. Whether or not that happens, that's, that's something left to be seen. But I do think it's an opportunity for places like New York City who've been really toe dipping into career pathways and others to provide feedback on this is how these programs align well, this is where they don't align well. Um, because ultimately, the folks who are working on the Hill don't have that experience. Um, again, there's a lot of interest in TANF reauthorization. Um, the, the two big things we heard, I met with the Ways and Means Committee while I was down there, the folks who were drafting the legislation, um, specifically around work participation rates and how that balances with training. Uh, and the other big one is around how you create career pathways out of poverty. So again, using the language that, they're, that we're used to hearing. Um, we also expect to see SNAP ENT, which is the sort of the cash assistance that's provided to folks who are working who are low income. Um, that's also going to be likely reauthorized as part of the farm bill this coming year. Um, and then we keep hearing that this infrastructure bill, this big infrastructure bill is coming in May. I would be shocked. I will bet my left shoe that that does not happen. These are nice shoes, by the way. <laughs> um, but tax reform is likely going to come first. We heard that over and over on the Hill. So if they can get through that in the next year, I'm guessing we'll see something related to infrastructure about a year later. OK, the state level. This is also not particularly bright and shiny, right? Um, just to give you an update on where we are, we're hearing, this is what the governor had pitched, and I'm sure Chris and folks can send you this PowerPoint. I won't go through it side by side in detail. Um, the good news is, is, again, a governor is a progressive guy. He wants to be seen as a progressive leader. And one of the things we're challenged with is many of the progressive ideals he has don't actually turn into policy, right? And so we have this sort of imbalance between the things that are presented and the things that are actually implemented. Um, we did see, however, a much bigger emphasis on workforce development this year. And so we had pushed really hard to get resources pulled out of the Regional Economic Development Council process. For folks who are unfamiliar with that process, it's sort of the once a year application process that communities can go through to, re to access resources. We were saying that's not how businesses work on a once a year basis. We need to pull some of those dollars out. And so the governor proposed pulling out $11 million. So there's an increase for summer youth employment, there's a million dollars um, hopefully coming out of the Environmental Protection Fund for youth training and green jobs, and then five million dollars, which was just recently released, as part of the VOA discretionary dollars for a tech hire type grant program. There's also intended to be $10 million for Buffalo for the part of this Buffalo Billion Advanced Manufacturing Training Program. Um, there's some other workforce-ish type incentives, and this goes to, to your comments before around tax credits. Um, there's an employee training incentive program, the New York Youth Jobs Program. And there's a se several other sort of CUNYs to meet type programs that are getting invested as well. Um, on the tax credit issue, I think it was clearly articulated there's some challenges getting businesses to see the value. Um, I'm certainly not opposed to making sure businesses are aware of it, but we sort of recognize across the board that we can't just tax credit our way through investing in workforce development. There actually needs to be tangible funds there as well. So we at NIATEP originated a couple of things in terms of advocacy this year. One was around creating an actual pot of money, a statewide trading fund. Um, the second was around creating some flexibility in economic development funding. So we went to the governor's office and asked for flexibility in the way that they turn capital funding to allow for human capital investment. And then lastly, establishing a wage data clearinghouse. I'm, if folks who know me know I am a labor market data junkie, and we need a better system to, to capture measure data in the state of New York, and so we really push that pretty hard. 
Um, I will say on these, um, this one is dead, dead in the ground, <laughs> buried very deeply. I don't think we'll get a way to declare in here how soon, but it doesn't mean we won't keep pushing. Um, this still has some legs. Um, in fact, I was just in communication with the Senate and the Assembly. There's some potential. We will see some of this flexibility. Um, the pushback I'm getting now for, for municipal junkies is they're not sure if they can use bond fund money to do this. And they said, oh, yes, you can. There's some research that shows you can. <laughs> so we'll see how far we get with this. And then this is still floating. Again, they're trying to find the resources for this right now. So we're hearing that it could be upwards of $10 million. We only asked for five. But again, the more resources we can get in the state budget, the better. The more insulation we have um, from the federal budget. Um, so for folks who are in New York City, you're welcome to join our membership meeting. We don't have the date for it set yet. It's going to be the week of the 15th. We will have an hour-long session on advocacy. So folks who are interested in getting more engaged, we're happy to talk to you about the tools and techniques. Um, but we also are going to be pushing in the month of August an open house project. Um, we did it two years ago. We had 45 sites across the state participate where they brought congressional members, their staff, um, New York State Senate and Assembly members to their programs to show what, what they're doing, to talk with the participants, to talk with the businesses. It was a huge success. We want to replicate that again. You're asking why August? Because Congress was home. So they're in district in August. So the workforce board, I get this all the time. I, I think I was in 15 of the 33 local areas just in the last six months. And I'm always asked, what could we do as workforce board members? Um, first, you are in very different circles than a lot of folks in the municipal government, right? You probably interact with staff or folks who are members of Congress or Assembly and Senate members relatively regularly. Um, I encourage, encourage you to talk about being on the local board. I think we need to constantly remind folks there's a board that needs to have innovative discussions around business engagement. Um, and again, consistently going down at the bottom here, being an ambassador, right? Every elevator you get, and we want to make sure one of the first things, hey, did you hear about the local workforce and stuff, right? <laughs> I'm being honest, right? It's, it's a small talk that folks make that tends to be how these connections get made, right? So even going back to how did you get your first job, a lot of it is through networking and small talk. Same thing, how do we get folks engaged in talking about the system? Um, over the summer, we're hoping that the city and that you all, folks who are hosting summer youth, might be willing to open your doors to host site visits. Again, for congressional reps, for staff, have folks come to graduations, have folks see, if you get if you're a, a union in a training facility, have them see folks in that training facility, what that looks like. Because what we find is the second a member of Congress or elected official has an experience, talks to a participant, they suddenly feel very connected to the program. Um, we had a congressman member out on Long Island who went to a youth build site once, he then was on a youth build caucus and was super committed to youth build for the rest of his tenure at Congress. So again, we encourage you to make those connections. And then finally, a huge aspect of what we need to do is collect the success stories. So I heard from Reynolds all these, these fantastic numbers around just what the board is doing alone around summer youth. Any success stories that the businesses have around engaging um, young people, adults, supporting group pathways or training programs, documenting them, getting them down, because those are the things that I need when I go to DC so that I can say, here, listen, I'm telling you this works. Here's a, a group of businesses who can talk about their story with you. So again, please collect those business stories. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. I know he has a couple of probing questions. But as you're going through this, um, feel free to contact me at any time. If you have questions, comments, or have heard something, or want to know what's going on in DC or at the state level, I'm always happy to be a resource. Um, my line is always open. But Chris, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks very much. So uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but I just want to pick, pick up where Melinda left off, um, and that to see, um, at least to put it out there, that we would be interested in getting additional letters from the board. Uh, I know that uh, Les graciously provided us with a letter that uh, made the sort of advocacy cut off, and Melinda, from what I understand, um, you know, these are these letters are still helpful, Always. and and we want to kind of continue to raise the visibility of what we're doing, particularly it sounds like for-profit company letters are thought to be more persuasive than the, than the current climate. Especially in this administration. Yes. Especially in this administration. <laughs> so um, if you are a, a, if you represent a for-profit company and you're interested in, in doing that, please let us know. Um, we are happy to help support you on that. We have some templates and we're really happy to work with you and answer any questions that you might have. Um, the second thing is the business success stories. And I really would like to try to start categorizing cataloging these um, for folks that are interested because I think we have some great stories to tell about what we do with youth, what we do with adults in the city. We have efficient and effective services and we just need to make the case that we're helping businesses and uh, New Yorkers. And so um, we, 
we do a better job of showing off the strength of our system. And so if there are members that are interested in uh, describing an experience that they've had, whether it be with customized training or some youth or athletic leaders or workforce one, uh, please let me know. Uh, and we'll also work with SPS and UICD to identify additional um, employers. And then finally, I, I really like this idea of hosting site visits. And we're, we've reached out to the, um, you know, the city has an intergovernmental affairs team. And there are folks that work on federal legislative stuff. And we're talking next week about that we can't just do this on our own. We've got to coordinate with them. But I, I, I think that there would be a lot of value in doing that. And I would welcome and invite any board members to, uh, if we're able to get those set up, attend um, you know, with us. Because I think we can deliver a powerful message. Uh, are there any questions about that or any folks that are eager to you know, volunteer to write this minute in the public about it? <laughs> So let me get this straight. Best case scenario, we lose seven million. Worst case, we lose twenty. And we're not talking to the city council yet. More, more than one. Up to up to thirty-eight. Well, I saw I saw the, the you know thirty percent. Yeah. So we need twenty million. So given here's my concern. Given the timing, the budgets are kind of. You got the state, the city, and then the federal government to some extent. Do we not have, should we not have an approach to the council to create a level of cushion to the best case scenario in terms of restoration? That's what's happening then. Right. No, and, and that, that sort of above my pay grade a little bit here, but there are, yes, that, that's an absolutely. But I don't think we want to turn the rest of our world and want to also push no, it. No, I got so yeah, I just, I think that, you know, you, you, you got to be proactive with this stuff. And if you just wait for the federal government to get its act straight, <laughs> I think we're in trouble, right? Yeah. I think we we got to have local strategy and state strategy before the, you know, whatever happens in the, Fed, the federal government. And, and I also, I would have to echo, and actually I have a question about the labor statistics that you said was there. The wage, wage. Yeah. Is that because the Department of Labor already provides that? No, so wage data clearinghouse would be an opportunity. So places like Pennsylvania or Massachusetts have a, a place where their labor market data as well as their unemployment insurance data, which is the wage data, that helps us understand whether or not someone's employed or not employed, is also been married in one. 